The Story of a Soul by St. Therese of Lisieux Chapter 10, Part 2 Your devotedness, dear mother, now that I am ill, has also taught me many a lesson of charity. No remedy is too costly, and if one does not succeed, you unhesitatingly try something new. When I am present at recreation, how careful you are to shield me from draughts! I feel that I ought to be as compassionate for the spiritual infirmities of my sisters as you are for my bodily ills. I have noticed that it is the holiest nuns who are most deeply loved. Everyone is anxious to seek their company and do them service, without even being asked. These very souls who are well able to bear with want of affection and little attentions are always surrounded by an atmosphere of love. Our Father, St. John of the Cross, says with great truth, All good things have come unto me since I no longer sought them for myself. Imperfect souls, on the contrary, are left alone. They are treated, it is true, with the measure of politeness which religious life demands, yet their company is avoided, lest a word might be said which would hurt their feelings. When I say imperfect souls, I am not referring to souls with spiritual imperfections only, for the holiest souls will not be perfect until they are in heaven. I mean those who are also afflicted with want of tact and refinement, as well as ultra-sensitive souls. I know such defects are incurable, but I also know how patient you would be in nursing and striving to relieve me, were my illness to last many years. From all this I draw the conclusion, I ought to seek the companionship of those sisters toward whom I feel a natural aversion, and try to be their good Samaritan. A word or a smile is often enough to put fresh life in a despondent soul. And yet it is not merely in the hope of giving consolation that I try to be kind. If it were, I know that I should soon be discouraged, for well-intentioned words are often totally misunderstood. Consequently, not to lose my time or labor, I try to act solely to please our Lord, and follow this precept of the Gospel. When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends or thy brethren, lest perhaps they also invite thee again, and a recompense be made to thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame, and thou shalt be blessed, because they have nothing wherewith to make thee recompense. And thy father, who seeth in secret, will repay thee. What feast can I offer my sisters but a spiritual one of sweet and joyful charity? I know none other. And I wish to imitate St. Paul, who rejoiced with those who rejoiced. It is true that he wept with those who wept, and at my feast, too, the tears must sometimes fall. Still, I shall always try to change them into smiles, for God loveth a cheerful giver. I remember an act of charity with which God inspired me while I was still a novice. And this act, though seemingly small, has been rewarded 
even in this life, by our Heavenly Father, who seeth in secret. Shortly before Sister St. Peter became quite bedridden, it was necessary every evening at ten minutes to six for some one to leave meditation and take her to the refectory. It cost me a good deal to offer my services, for I knew the difficulty, or, should I say, the impossibility, of pleasing the poor invalid. But I did not want to lose such a good opportunity, for I recalled our Lord's words, As long as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. I therefore humbly offered my aid. It was not without difficulty that I induced her to accept it. But after considerable persuasion I succeeded. Every evening when I saw her shake her sand-glass, I understood that she meant, Let us go. Summoning up all my courage, I rose, and the ceremony began. First of all, her stool had to be moved and carried, in a particular way, and on no account must there be any hurry. The solemn procession ensued. I had to follow the good sister, supporting her by her girdle. I did it as gently as possible, but if by some mischance she stumbled, she imagined I had not a firm hold, and that she was going to fall. "'You are going too fast,' she would say. "'I shall fall and hurt myself.' Then, when I tried to lead her more quietly, "'Come quicker. I cannot feel you. You are letting me go. I was right when I said you were too young to take care of me.' When we reached the refectory without further mishap, more troubles were in store. I had to settle my poor invalid in her place, taking great pains not to hurt her. Then I had to turn back her sleeves, always according to her special rubric, and after that I was allowed to go. But I soon noticed that she found it very difficult to cut her bread, so I did not leave her till I had performed this last service. She was much touched by this attention on my part, for she had not expressed any wish on the subject. It was by this unsought-for kindness that I gained her entire confidence, and chiefly because as I learnt later, at the end of my humble task, I bestowed upon her my sweetest smile. Dear Mother, it is long since all of this happened, but our Lord allows the memory of it to linger with me, like perfume from heaven. One cold winter evening I was occupied in the lowly work of which I have just spoken, when suddenly I heard in the distance the harmonious strains of music outside the convent walls. I pictured a drawing-room, brilliantly lighted and decorated, and richly furnished. Young ladies, elegantly dressed, exchanged a thousand compliments, as is the way of the world. Then I looked on the poor invalid I was tending. Instead of sweet music, I heard her complaints. Instead of rich gilding, I saw the brick walls of our bare cloister, scarcely visible in the dim light. The contrast was very moving. Our Lord so illuminated my soul with the rays of truth before which the pleasures of the world are as but darkness, that for a thousand years of such worldly delights I would not have bartered even the ten minutes spent 
in my act of charity. If even now, in days of pain, and amid the smoke of battle, the thought that God has withdrawn us from the world is so entrancing, what will it be when, in eternal glory and everlasting repose, we realize the favor beyond compare he has done us here by singling us out to dwell in his Carmel, the very portal of heaven. I have not always felt these transports of joy in performing acts of charity. But at the beginning of my religious life, Jesus wished to make me feel how sweet to him is charity when found in the hearts of his spouses. Thus, when I led Sister St. Peter, it was with so much love that I could not have shown more were I guiding our Divine Lord Himself. The practice of charity has not always been so pleasant, as I have just pointed out, dear Mother. And to prove it, I will recount some of my many struggles. For a long time my place at meditation was near a sister who fidgeted continually either with her rosary or with something else. Possibly, as I am very quick of hearing, I alone heard her. But I cannot tell you how much it tried me. I should have liked to turn round and by looking at the offender make her stop the noise. But in my heart I knew that I ought to bear it tranquilly both for the love of God and to avoid giving pain. So I kept quiet. <laughs> but the effort cost me so much that sometimes I was bathed in perspiration, and my meditation consisted merely in suffering with patience. After a time I tried to endure it in peace and joy at least deep down in my soul. And I strove to take actual pleasure in the disagreeable little noise. Instead of trying not to hear it, which was impossible, I set myself to listen as though it had been some delightful music, and my meditation, which was not the prayer of quiet, was passed in offering this music to the Lord. Another time I was working in the laundry, and the sister opposite, while washing handkerchiefs, repeatedly splashed me with dirty water. My first impulse was to draw back and wipe my face, to show the offender that I should be glad if she should behave more quietly. But the next minute I thought, how foolish it was to refuse the treasures God offered me so generously, and I refrained from betraying my annoyance. On the contrary, I made such efforts to welcome the shower of dirty water that at the end of half an hour I had taken quite a fancy to this novel kind of aspersion, and I resolved to come as often as I could to the happy spot where such treasures were freely bestowed. Dear Mother, you see that I am a very little soul, who can only offer very little things to our Lord. It still happens that I frequently let slip the occasion of these slender sacrifices, which bring so much peace. But this does not discourage me. I bear the loss of a little peace, and I try to be more watchful for the future. How happy 
does our Lord make me? And how sweet and easy is his service on this earth? He has always given me what I desired. Or rather, he has made me desire what he wishes to give. A short time before my terrible temptation against faith, I had reflected how few exterior trials worthy of mention had fallen to my lot, and that if I were to have interior trials, God must change my path. And this I did not think he would do. Yet I could not always live at ease. Of what means, then, would he make use? I had not long to wait for an answer, and it showed me that he whom I love is never at a loss, for without changing my way he sent me this great trial, and thus mingled a healing bitterness with all the sweet. End of part two, end of chapter ten.